The following program sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. And it's Thursday, so we're going to be talking about Monday. And the program's repeated on Friday and on Saturday. So if you miss it today, Thursday, you can hear me Friday, same program. You can hear me Saturday, same program. We're going to be talking about money. There's a lot of things to talk about today. My goal for this program is to put you, the listeners, ahead of the curve to give you insight into different industries, into different companies, into things that put you ahead instead of behind. A lot to cover today, but I started thinking a little bit that remember when we talked about clouds, they were in the sky? Remember when an app was something you put in when you wanted a job? Remember when a tweet was something a bird did? Spring's coming, the birds are tweeting. Remember when the at key was a useless key on the typewriter? Remember what a typewriter was. Remember 4G was a parking place? Remember that LinkedIn was actually a prison and Snap was something you did with your fingers. Yelp was something you yelled in pain. Well, the world is changing, not just in some aspects, but in most aspects and financial services too. When you think about what's been going on, We've been converting from a hardware society to a software. There's two fundamental changes. Companies are replacing their physical product with software equivalents, and companies are extending their business processes through software. And the result is that some businesses will rise from nothing, and we've seen that happening, and some will die. Remember Tower Records? It wasn't that long ago that you went to Tower Records to get an album or a CD you know, Tower Records is gone. And between 2003 and 2007, 2,700 record stores went out of business. Music became digital instead of being an analog, instead of being something you put in a record player to play on your, your record player, your hi-fi, whatever you might have called it in those days, or a cassette tape you put into cassette or a CD player. Music became digitalized. And not only that, you could download what song you wanted to for 99 cents. There was a whole small niche of industry people that worked on records. Their whole job was to design albums to decide what song came first, what came last, what came in the middle, what, how, you, how you structured an album. A lot of that has gone away because you can choose whatever song you want to choose and download it for 99 cents. Tremendous change in what went on in the music industry. I was chairman of the board of Seattle Theater Group at the time we were going through that whole process, and I watched as things changed. It used to be that people would go on concert tours to promote their records or to promote their CDs. Today, they send out their CDs to promote their tours. The money is made on the tour. We've gone through a tremendous change. Remember, in the newspaper business, we used to have two newspapers in Seattle, a morning paper and an evening paper. The Seattle Times used to come in the evening. The PI used to come in the morning. Now we have one. And not only do we have one, but it seems to get smaller every month. Smaller in size, smaller in number of pages, and smaller in some of the local news they cover. The classifieds were a big moneymaker for the newspapers. And along came Monster, and away went a lot of the classifieds. And then, or at least the job portion of the classifieds, which was a large portion of the classifieds, and then along came Craigslist. 
and Monster essentially went away. Subscriptions have dropped by almost 70% to newspapers. Most people get it online. I can remember for a while I took three daily newspapers, actually sometimes four daily newspapers, used to read the news, and my children used to say, did you hear about this? And I'd say, no. They said, you'd read about it in the paper the next day. And that's really true. Most people are reading the news almost immediately when it happens. The times have changed. There's been an evolution in the financial services industry. It's been something that has been slow, but it's been picking up, and it's going to continue to change. I licensed in 1986, but if you go back to May 1st in 1975, it was a big change because instead of fixed price commissions, commissions could be negotiated. Back in the 70s, in the 60s, trades were done on a commission basis. There, was, there weren't fees. Nobody did a fee account. They were all commission-based, and they were a fixed commission. If you did 100 shares at Lehman Brothers, it was X amount. It was the same amount at Merrill. It was the same amount at Shearson. It was the same amount at whoever you might be. The fixed price commissions went away in 1975, May 1st, 1975. Most of the brokerage houses didn't see that as any issue. You know, commissions could be negotiated, but it wasn't going to be, make a big difference. They had 100% of the market anyway. So what difference would it really make? Well, to a guy by the name of Charles Schwab, it made a big difference. And he got, had the idea of doing discounted trades. That happened in the 1970s. But by 1999, one-third of all investors had at least one discount account. They might have regular brokerage accounts, full, full board accounts, but one-third had a discount brokerage account as well. It was a huge, significant change. In 1986, when I licensed, over 90%, 95%, of the revenues were generated in the big brokerage houses, the wire houses. That's where the revenues were generated. I came in as a stockbroker, came in as a stock jockey. That was where the stock brokerage houses, the broker dealers were going. They had commissions, you could negotiate commissions, you could reduce them some, but it was really a commission type business at that time. The average family income when I licensed in 1986, the average family income was $43,000 a year. Now, if you joined a firm and became a stockbroker, if you only did $43,000 worth of business, you would find you were soon out of on the street. They didn't want low producers. The average producer at that time was producing over 100000 in revenues. That's where the cutoff became. You had to produce 100000 in revenues. You had to, to move that amount of, of commissions through your, your client accounts, or they really didn't want you. That too, like negotiated commissions, became a change in this industry. Because what happened is those people who were producing less than 100000 went off. They started their own small firms. And that's become... A significant change in the industry. Now they did that in a different way because most financial advisors fall under the Securities and Exchange Act of 1932. And there's not going to be a quiz, so you don't have to remember whether it was 32 or 33, whatever. But <clears throat> that was a broker-dealer setup. And the stockbrokers, the financial advisors, whatever you wanted to call them, were actually the actual title is registered representatives. And they had to be sure that any investment they recommended to clients was suitable. The small people that went out, that were f pushed out the door, licensed under the Investment Company Act of 1940. There was a significant change because registered under that, they became registered investment advisors or investment advisors, and they fell under a fiduciary standard. 
The fiduciary standard said you had to make every decision in the best interest of your clients. There was a difference. I grew up in the registered representative world. If you had two investments, one paid more and one paid less, you could recommend the one that paid the broker more because both were suitable. As long as they were suitable, you could increase your commission by charging the higher value. That still exists today, by the way. That's what the fight about is the Department of Labor rule. But that was a change that was taking place. Not only did those small producers leave the big firms, but you began to get a migration of larger and larger people leaving those firms. I left a firm. I left a firm in 2005. That was a trend that's been going on. And today, almost 50% of the revenues that are created by advisors are created by the registered investment advisor. That was a significant change. And the registered investment advisor, rather than doing commission-based, started to do fee-based accounts. That worked its way back into the traditional brokerage house, but it began with the registered investment advisor who had to make every decision in the best interest of their client. We're coming to a commercial break, and I'll tell you what's going on because that's history, but things are changing even more dramatically now. Be right back after the commercial break. Keep with me. We've got a lot to cover today. About Money with Mike Adams will resume in a moment on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Did you know the 20-year annualized S&P return was 8.19%, while the 20-year annualized return for the average equity mutual fund investor was just 4.67%? That's a gap of 3.52%. It doesn't sound like much now, but it could mean the difference between retiring in comfort and running out of money. For some seniors, a gap that large could cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars and cut their retirement short. Don't run out of money. Call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts today, 206-903-1019, and learn more about how you can, one, create wealth for retirement, and two, protect yourself from running out of money. Adams Financial Concepts specializes in creating and maintaining wealth. Call today, 206-903-1019, or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. We're back with more about money. For details on what you hear on today's show, visit AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Now, here again is Mike Adams. So I've been talking about the changes that have gone on in different industries, but in particular, the financial services industry. We saw the advent of the discount broker. We saw the change that's happened with registered investment advisors taking half the market share from the the brokerage houses, the broker dealers, the big names. But there's also other changes that are going on because in the last couple of years, the internet's allowed a new growth of fintech, fintech, a growth of robo-advisors. You know, one of the things that happened, there's an expression, and let me back up a second. There's an expression that says, be careful what you want because you'll get it. I remember going through the brokerage houses. I was one of the first to do fee-based business for the brokerage house that I was with. And as I did that, there was a big push as they brought more and more stockbrokers and financial advisors into the the equation, into the the business of doing fee-based business. There was this expression, sell the perf- sell the relationship, not the performance. Sell the relationship, not the performance. Make people like you. Make people really, really like you so they really don't care about what the performance is. Be careful what you want because you're going to get it. And that's what they got. You know, if Dalbar does a report and they look at how mutual fund investors have done, and most of the people that are doing that kind of business are doing mutual funds rather than the old stock picking. And 
So Dalbar does a report, and they have looked at what the returns have been over the last 30 years for the average mutual fund investor. And it includes those who are advised by advisors and those who are not advised at all, those who are doing their own picks. And the latest report shows that for the last 30 years, the average stock mutual fund person who's invested has achieved a return of 3.69%. What that means is if they would have started with $100,000 30 years ago, that 100000 would have almost tripled, 286000 That's what the average mutual fund investor has achieved. The Standard & Poor's, in comparison, was up 11.11% during that 30-year time period. That means 100000 invested in the Standard & Poor's into an index fund, essentially, would have been worth $2.1 million. That's a significant, huge difference. So what happens is that we've seen a tremendous amount of pressure on fees. The average fee has dropped. When I started in the business, the average fee was at 3% for the first 100000 250, 500000 The average fee was 3%. It's now down to 1%. And some people are even less than 1%. And when you think about 3.69% at 1%, that makes a significant difference than 1% of 11%. Significant, significant difference between those two. So there's been a tremendous pressure on fees coming down. But the pressure may not be over because, as I mentioned, we're now seeing the robo-advisor. As in... As in the discount brokers, from 1975 to 1999, one-third of investors ended up having a discount brokerage account. Some had both the regular account and the discount. As we've seen that in 1999, what we're seeing now is 46% of investors are at least aware of the robo-advisor and are considering opening an account with a robo-advisor. 46%, that's almost half the investors. And why? Because a robo-advisor can essentially do everything a financial advisor is doing today. They can do the financial plan. They can do the investment structure. They can do asset allocation. They can do the things that most financial advisors do, especially since the focus is on the relationship and not the performance. So, yes, maybe it's more important than ever that financial advisors sell the relationship because their fees are going to really be squeezed down. And if you look at what's going on industry-wide, we hit a maximum of revenues, net revenues for the industry in 2007. Revenues are beginning to shrink in the industry, even though there's more trades, even though there's more money in the system, the fees are coming down. And I would guess that they're going to continue to come down. Now, I was at the Best Practices Workshop last October. It was in New York City. It was where they gathered up a survey of most financial advisor practices, and they put those together, and they looked at that and the returns. They looked at the growth, they looked at where people were getting business from. They looked at a huge number of factors going into this. I think it took me two days to complete the survey, two full days. But one thing that came out of it is they were talking about how growth has changed over the last few years. Average growth in 2015 had slowed down in the business to 8%. And if they, they looked at the sources of the growth of assets, Client referrals were 1.8%. Professional referrals were one2 Contributions were 2.8%. Business development was the big thing. It's grown over the last five years to 6.4%. You lose about 2.7% of your clients. You distribute 2.4% now to people who are retired and the money's going out. And the performance for the average firm in 2015 the performance was minus 2.4%. That's pretty incredible. The performance, minus 2.4%. That's 
not a very significant factor in why people should be performing. In my opinion, it's, it's really a disaster. That's going to push people more and more toward the robo-advisors. And so what you're seeing for growth is you're seeing a lot of merger and acquisition activity. You're seeing people call. I get calls once or twice a week for people that want to buy my business to see if I'm interested in selling. That's happening. And if you're listening to this, you may have an advisor who sold his practice and you're getting a new advisor. That's happening. Is the performance going to be any better? Probably not. But there's another aspect that came out and is available as of last year. It allows financial advisors to actually do a performance-based account so that they can share in the profits. No profits, you don't pay them anything. Profits are up 10% or whatever the profits are, you pay 20%. So there's a real incentive to perform and get a profit. There's no guarantee there'll be a profit. But at least if you lose money, so does the financial advisor. If you look at it, looking back at Dalbar's numbers, the 3.69, there's a reason that the fees were low. 11%, 2.1 million, you'll pay a lot more in fees. You know, I did the calculation. At 3.9%, if you're paying 1% in fees, you'll pay about 53,000 over 30 years. If you pay 20% of the growth, you'll pay fees of about 400,000, but you end up with 1.7 million. Would you rather have 286,000 or 1.7 million? That's the choice that's happening. The choice seems to be bimodal. It seems to be moving toward the robo-advisor, the robo-advisor that's doing things at a very cheap rate and cookie cutter kind of thing, automated, complete automation, or somebody that's performance oriented to see that your account grows, not just at an index rate, but superior to index rate. The world's changing in my industry as well. Okay. Anyway, there's a lot of things. We've got a lot more to cover today. And I want to introduce my guest today. Very interesting company, very interesting people. Friends of children. You wouldn't think about that much as a business, but it is a business. My guests today are Kelly McKee, who is the executive director, and Linda Perlstein, if I said the name right. Did I? It works. Perlstein. <laughs> okay. I mispronounce a lot of names, so I'm sorry. Welcome to the program. So why don't we start with your background, Kelly? Well, over the last seven years, I've had the pleasure of being the executive director of Friends of the Children, which has been an amazing experience. And um, over the last 25 years, I've been working to improve programs and policies that um, make a difference for children and families and, uh, and really ensure that all our children have the same kinds of opportunities to succeed in life. We're going to come back to that. How about your background, Linda? I was a journalist, and from there I went to consult in the social sector. Um, I've also worked at Amazon, and I joined the board of Friends of the Children because I had read about the nonprofit success in improving outcomes for Seattle's most at-risk kids and was convinced that it was something I wanted to be a part of. So I've been on the board for three years. Great. So we're going to talk about Friends of Children in just a minute. We're coming to a commercial break. So... You said that you were involved with Friends of Children for seven years, but it's not a new organization. It didn't begin seven years ago. It began in Portland, as I understand. Yes, it began in Portland in 1994. It was founded by businessman Duncan Campbell, who as a child um, grew up in poverty and uh, didn't have a stable home environment, and uh, he later went to college and became a successful businessman and then founded Friends of the Children so other children would have a better life. So we're going to hear about that right after this commercial break, which is coming. And we've got so much more to get to. And if you missed this, this program or part of this program, you can 
dial in and it's a podcast on our website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. It's also on iTunes, right? No, YouTube. YouTube. YouTube, iTunes. I get it. Okay. <laughs> More about money coming up with Mike Adams on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Now we return to About Money. There's more information waiting for you at adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here again is your host, Mike Adams. So I'm here with Linda and Kelly of Friends of the Children. We're talking about the organization, the business, but let's talk about what Friends of the Children do. We find the children who at age five or six are already struggling in kindergarten, already having trouble making friends, um, perhaps not going to school very often, um, maybe not making friends or feeling sad or angry, some of them acting out and having behavior challenges at school. And we then, in partnership with their families, um, we commit to them for 12 and a half years through high school graduation, ensuring their success no matter what. And how we do that is we hire salaried, full-time, college-educated, professional mentors who then meet with children every week, week after week, all year long, and are committed to um, helping them set and achieve goals and to succeed in school and to learn the skills that they need um, to succeed in life. That's, a, that's an incredible undertaking. Well, it is really important. And uh, in Seattle, we um, have children that, um, without receiving this kind of support, um, ultimately would um, likely end up um, incarcerated, parenting as teens, um, dropping out of school. Um, but by getting involved um, with them early and providing um, intensive weekly support, encouragement, and guidance, um, they have every chance of succeeding. And, uh, and that's what we've seen. And uh, over time, um, our program graduates, 80% um, of them have finished high school and 90% uh, of them are um, involved productively in the community, engaged in um, education programs or work. And that's exactly what we were hoping for. And I want to... I want to point out that 80% uh, might not uh, seem that impressive for someone who's not familiar with the context, but if you're looking at a population of Seattle's most at-risk students, the fact that 80% of them are graduating high school is actually a really, really huge accomplishment. They become, these are the students that otherwise might become a drag on society, might become the the criminals might become the the non-working persons. Exactly. And uh, the Harvard Business Association um, in Oregon actually did an economic analysis and found that for every dollar invested in Friends of the Children, there's a $7 return to society in terms of the savings from completing education and avoiding incarceration and avoiding the welfare system that um, inevitably results from teen parenthood. So let's talk about the background of these children. You know, they come out of what kind of a situation? Well, most of the children have um, faced trauma. They've uh, had multiple moves, sometimes several times in a year. Um, and when they move homes, then they're also typically changing schools. 
Um, these are children that are exposed to domestic violence and uh, drug addiction um, among family members and uh, who, who grow up really um, not having stability, not having anyone in their life um, that's a, a, a consistent, um, supportive adult. So by having um, their professional mentor from Friends of the Children get involved in their lives when they're age five or six, they then have someone who's committed to their well-being no matter what, who will be there for them week after week and who will stay with them through those moves and, and follow them and uh, commit to them no matter what. So, um, you know, despite all of those risks, these children can succeed. So most of the children, you talked about teen parents. How many of the children come from teen mother? 95% of the children were born to a mother who was a teen parent. So um, that means that um, that parent first um, had a baby when she was a teenager. And that typically sets up a young woman for a lifetime of poverty, just because it is so hard to then complete education and um, to then um, find a job that will provide a, a, a living for a family. And so when there are several children, those obligations just keep piling up, and it's very hard to ever really climb out of that. And teen pregnancy can be very perpetuating in a family, so... Teen, children born to teen parents often become teen parents themselves, but the children who have been served by friends of the children, um, almost all of them are avoiding teen pregnancy. Same goes for incarceration. Uh, at least half of them have a parent who's been incarcerated, and near, nearly all of them are avoiding incarceration too. So it's really breaking the cycle of poverty and, and sort of surmounting these challenges in a way that's not common. It's it's a marvelous program. So funding comes from whom? We are um, nearly all privately funded. Um, our funding comes from individuals and companies um, and foundations here in Seattle. And uh, we are very much dependent on um, those who um, want to invest in these children's success. And uh, like I said, you know, a seven to one return on investment sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And uh, we're really proud of um, all that we've been able to succeed to, uh, all that we've been able to accomplish because of that investment. And in fact, just this last week, um, Friends of the Children Seattle was notified that we received the Social Innovation Fund Award and we'll be able to double the number of children served over the next four years. And this is from the federal government, so it's not just um, it's not just local foundations and individuals that are uh, putting their confidence in the organization. This is um, this is a federal grant that's going to allow us to really grow. The trick is we just have to match it. So, so how much are you <laughs> looking to match? One point two million dollars over four years. And that's how right. are you going to do that? Well, we are going to be asking our community members to invest in our children's success. And, uh, and so far, we've had a, a great response. And uh, we have um, people like the Balmers and Gary Rubens investing in Friends of the Children. And we know that, that over time that people um, giving at whether it's um, – Two hundred dollars, or two thousand, or two hundred thousand—it all adds up to make a difference. And we're really looking for um, anyone who cares about children and would really like to make sure that the children who are most vulnerable have this opportunity su to succeed. So, how would they make the donation? Let's talk about the specifics and the logistics. Let's get sure. down to it. Well, it's really easy. You just go to our website, which is friendsseattle.org and click on donate and uh, that's all you do and a donation at any level makes a difference and we really encourage people to consider um, making a donation that will be recurring so um, if uh, $200 is a lot for you or 2000 is a lot for you then you can break it up into one month increments and it'll just um, be charged on your credit card each month 
Um, and that's a really easy way to go. And many of us can give more when we uh, make those recurring gifts. And also, when you go to our website, again, that's friendsseattle.org, you can also find other ways to get involved, like coming to an event or um, volunteering in a variety of ways. And we're looking for people who have um, various skills to get involved, whether it's serving on a committee or getting involved in fundraising or becoming a reading buddy. So just contact us and we'll find a way to plug you in. I so, want to point out that we're a nonprofit, so all contributions are tax deductible. And you mentioned an event. You have one big event, right? We have one big event called Inspiring Greatness, and that is in October. And you can go to our website to learn more. Um, we also have a Bowling with Friends event in April. And again, I encourage you to go to our website and you can sign up and sponsor a team and come to our event and raise money. And we would love to have you involved. So go over that again. Website is? www.friendsseattle.org. And is there a place for somebody that doesn't have a computer that wants to make a phone call? Yes, you can call our number, which is 206-328-3535, and we will happily take your donation over the phone. So say the phone number again. 206-328-3535. And say it one more time. 206-328-3535. So if anybody's written that down, you should have hit written it down. You've got a website. It's a tremendous organization that does a tremendous amount for the the city at a time when the city is dealing with homelessness. A lot of these young children probably would end up on the streets at one time or another. So, I mean, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Well, we appreciate all your support, and we need investments from our community to be successful and achieve our goals and to be able to reach more children. So do log on to the website and do make a donation. It's well worth it. We've got more to come on this the program. I want to shift gears and talk about some changes that are going on that are going to have significant impacts on investments and then where you put your money and how you put your money in. So don't go away. We're coming up to a commercial break. You can like us on Facebook, About Money on Facebook. You can like me on Facebook, Mike Adams. You can you can go on to Twitter and add About Money on Twitter. So do all those things. Join us. Check the website. And we'll be right back after this commercial break. Stay tuned. About Money returns in a moment with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. How do you picture retirement? House on the beach, small farm in the country, traveling the world with your spouse. The one thing you don't picture is running out of money. Retirement dreams are shattered all too often by poor investment choices, sending many retirees back to work. If you think the job market is tough now, try entering it after you've retired. Don't run out of money. Start planning now. Call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts today at 206-903-1019 and learn more about how you can create wealth for retirement and probably, most importantly, protect yourself from running out of money. Adams Financial Concepts specializes in creating and maintaining wealth. Call today, 206-903-1019, or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So it was just a year ago that I responded to an article that was on Bloomberg News written by Tom Randall one year ago, February 23rd, 2016. It was an article that said that OPEC that, and the head of OPEC, the head of ExxonMobil, predicted that electric cars would only be 1% of the vehicles that were sold in 2040. 
They said that it really wasn't going to impact oil consumption at all. And I said, I really felt that was wrong. I felt that we were in an S-curve. A technology normally will go through a slow buildup. It'll then rapidly increase and then level off. We were going through that S-curve. And I mentioned that it was sometimes hard to see what was going on. And I used the example of the biggest issues in the 1890s and early 1900s. The biggest issues for cities were transportation, just like Seattle, only a, a lot different. Because transportation in the, in the 1890s was the horse. They did personal transportation. They did heavy equipment. They did the freight. But horses left behind manure and urine. The average horse left behind 40 pounds of manure every day. The, the piles of manure in New York City were 50 and 60 feet high. You had dysentery, you had typhoid fever, you had all those issues. You had people who were employed in those cities that would sweep the streets so that you could get from one side to the other. Horses died, they were left in the streets. You had dogs, you had pigs, you had cats. You had a, a huge problem, but all that disappeared with the automobile. You had international congresses. How are we going to deal with it? It just disappeared. We face some of those same kind of things today because the predictions in a year have already changed. 1% was really low. 1% was really low. The forecast were anywhere from 1% to 4% of the cars. Mark Fields, the CEO of Ford Motor Company, came out this last week and predicted that by 2030, over 50% of cars will be electric vehicles. Not four, not one, not 10, 50% of vehicles will be electric. Ford's planning 13 new electric vehicle models in the next five years. Volkswagen is planning 30 new battery fueled vehicles. And it's a, it's a dual factor coming out. It's the cost of batteries is shrinking significantly and emissions because the biggest emission of carbon fumes are cars. But that's going to impact oil. You know, we've gone through this whole period of time. We went through a period of time in the early 2000s where we talked about peak oil. We were going to run out of oil. We talked about oil prices. They began to soar. They, began, they reached $157 a barrel at that time because you had a whole number of people that were talking about peak oil. We were going to run out of oil. doesn't seem that that's going to happen right now. If you look at oil and you look at the consumption of oil, the forecast are by 2030, we'll be doing 118 million barrels a day. 118 million. Today we're doing under 100, about 98 million. Of that, transportation makes up over 40% of consumption of oil. That's, that's a significant amount. Fuel oil is about 20%. That probably will tend to decrease a little bit, but not much. Jet fuel makes up another 9%. So if you take just those two factors, the transportation and the jet fuel, that's over 50%. What happens as those begin to shrink? What happens? as we begin to see electric vehicles. In my, my thoughts, are we going to see a reduction in the actual consumption of oil? If you look at where oil is being used right now, the two biggest factors are transportation and industrial, but even on the industrial side. If you read the Seattle Times today, they talked about Amazon using and converting to solar generated server farms. Server farms take a huge amount of electricity to run all those servers. They're moving toward solar powering those farms. And the, the thing about solar power is once you install it, you have a very minimal cost of operating. 
But all of that also has an impact. Consumption of oil may be decreasing over a period of time. Solar may be increasing and will increase. But what also will happen is there will be significant changes with what goes on in allocation. Think about the the utilities. Right now, utilities are struggling. When you're in a utility, you're making a long-term investment in power generating facilities. You go out, you borrow the money, you use the money, and you depend upon the revenues to pay off the bonds or pay off the borrowing for those facilities. But as we begin to have more and more solar, you begin to experience problems. Probably the best example of that today is Nevada Power. Nevada Power reached the point where they took it to their legislature because demand was growing slowly. It's been growing at about 1% per year. But people have been installing solar panels at a much greater rate. And the way it was set up with Nevada Power is that consumers were charged $12 a month, plus they were charged $0.11 per kilowatt hour. But if you put in a solar panel and you generated more solar power than you were consuming, that went back into the grid and was purchased at $0.11 per kilowatt hour. The issue was that they were having to buy back solar power, and that was reducing the demand for the the rest of their installations. So what did they do? They went to the legislature and they proposed and were successful in getting a change. They now charge customers $38 a month for their power, 11 cents to buy power and for solar power feeding back into the system, two cents a kilowatt hour, not 11. We're changing the, the dynamics of the electric utilities. We're changing the dynamics of oil. We're going through a very, very big change in energy consumption and energy production. That means that there's going to be opportunities for the right to be in the right place. And there's going to be some disasters for being in the wrong place. The idea of this program is to give you insight, so that you're ahead of the curve and behind the curve, so that you're not taken by surprise, but that you can take advantage of the changes that are going on and be in the right investments at the right time, out of the wrong investments and into the right investments. That's what this program is about, and that's where we focus, and that's what we do. That's going to wrap us up for today. We had great guests friends of the children, do log on to their website and do donate. They've got funds to raise and they get a seven to one return. I don't get that kind of return for the money I invest in my business. It's an excellent return. And have a very wonderful week. I'll be back next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Until then, have a great week. You've been listening to About Money with Mike Adams, a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you want Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared on the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again for more About Money with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. 
The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Okay, so Phil Grandy won't be quite as hurt that you missed today's meeting at noon if you promise to hear the rebroadcast tonight at 9. So race the following program sponsored by Adams Financial.